I have made many mistakes, many mistakes in my time of owning plants. And I often think that there's so many like simple, simple things that if I was to go back and change and do differently, I would avoid so much drama in my collection and so much death as well, because I have lost many a plant along the way. So today I thought I would take you through some of the rookie errors that I made when I was kind of just trying to figure things out with different types of plants, things that I would have done differently, and hopefully this will mean that your plants can be much healthier, happier, and just give you less grief. But first, if you're new here, hi, my name's Claire, and this is Yuli. I make videos all about houseplant care, sharing tips and tricks I've learned over the years to help keep your plants happy and healthy. And I genuinely wish that I could go back in time and tell myself some of these things because I just think it would have helped to make me a better and more confident grower as well. But I really hope that it is useful for you and I hope you enjoy it. Let's get into it. So the first mistake I have made many, many times is not acclimating my plants correctly. And the word acclimation basically just means the period of adjustment that your plants go through from you picking it up wherever you bought it, whether it's online in a garden center and bringing it back to your home and reaching a stage at which it's happy and settled in its new environment. And I think a lot of the time the word acclimation, when people hear it, they tend to think it just applies to imported plants from overseas. And that is so not the case. Now, don't get me wrong, there is a very good reason people tend to associate acclimation with imported plants. The reason being that typically when you import plants, you're probably gonna have imported from somewhere like Ecuador, Thailand, Indonesia, somewhere that has very hot, bright, humid conditions that are, let's just say, very different from a UK home environment, a typical UK home environment. So in that case, the acclimation process sometimes has to be a little bit more intense, let's say. And I've brought over an example of what I do when I sometimes acclimate imported plants myself. And I've just got a little plastic bag over this one. And as you can see, there's lots of moisture buildup on the inside. And this has essentially just meant this plant has been able to create its own little microclimate so that it replicates more what it would have been receiving in its old habitat, if that makes sense. This is actually not an imported plant. This is one of my rehab plants. I'm just using it as an example. But yeah, I will just keep this little bag on as the plant starts to adjust. And then gradually, 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 I will start to take it off a few hours here and there until it has just adjusted to normal room conditions in my own home. And as I say, although this is spoken about a lot more with imports, it 100% applies to any time you bring a new plant into your home. You could have picked one up at your local garden center that's five minutes away from where you live and I will still try to acclimate it gradually. There are some types of plants that might not require this as much, for example, if you pick up a rubber plant, a Ficus elastica, they are typically very hardy plants and don't always require that much acclimation in my experience. But if you pick up a Calathea, an Alocasia, certain types of Monstera, they can be much more finicky and take their time to get used to your new space. So what I would recommend doing, and again, wish I could tell myself, wish I could tell old Claire this, I would just look at the environment where your plant came from. If it came from a greenhouse and it was receiving really good light, really good heat, then I would just, as I say, try and replicate that a little bit in your own home for the first week or two as much as you can. And then in the exact same way as I'm doing with this one, I would just slowly, slowly, slowly start to ease it into life in your normal home environment. Sometimes obviously there's little tweaks that you're gonna have to do. If you bring in a plant that absolutely loves high levels of humidity, maybe invest in a little humidifier and put that next to it. But basically most plants can be acclimated to slightly different conditions than what they naturally would grow in in their natural habitats. They are more adaptable than we give them credit for. You just need to take it very slowly. And something that people often forget is that acclimating plants can actually apply to the plants that you already own within your own home if you're moving them about. And my Monstera Deliciosa that I've got here behind me is a prime example of this. This is a plant that when I first moved in here, 
had lived in my mum's conservatory and I had been used to getting very high levels of light. And when it got to summer, I was thinking to myself, oh my goodness, I could put this plant out on my balcony. I could grow it outdoors in direct sunlight. And because I didn't acclimate it slowly, because I didn't put it outside for an hour or two, bring it back in and kind of gradually, gradually, gradually do that over time, it very sadly burnt. And you might not be able to tell from here because actually I did a very cheeky thing and I painted the areas of the leaf that had burnt. I'm not saying I'd recommend doing this, but it's what I chose to do. So yeah, if you've got a plant, for example, this plant here in a fairly dark corner and I decide that I want to move it to a different space in my house, whatever that space may be, if its conditions are gonna be different, do it slowly, do it as a gradual, gradual change. So for example, if I was going to put my big Monstera Deliciosa outside on the balcony this year in the summer, what I would do is over, over the course of a week or a couple of weeks, I would slowly start moving it closer to the window and then I would start putting it outside for an hour and then I would bring it in and then I'd put it outside for two hours and so on and so forth until it was acclimated and adjusted. So many mistakes are also often made when you don't do enough research into the soil or substrate that your plant likes to grow in. And a lot of this actually, if you're not quite sure, a lot of this can actually be kind of figured out by, again, looking at your plant's natural habitats. And a quick Google can tell you usually where your plant is native to, how it naturally grows. And for example, if you find out that you've got an epiphytic jungle cacti, epiphytic just means that it's a plant that naturally likes to grow attached to other plants attached to rocks, it doesn't tend to grow from the ground directly up, then typically you might not be looking at a soil. You might be looking at kind of lots of bark, moss, that sort of thing. But equally, if you're dealing with a succulent or a desert cacti or something like that that doesn't like retaining huge amounts of water, you're probably going to need something very well draining. And I've brought two plants over here to use as an example. And I've got a variegated jade plant, a Crassula ovata just here. And this is one, and this is actually actually one of my least finicky succulents but growing this one it needs a lot of grit it needs a lot of sand it needs lots of components within its soil to allow it to drain properly so it's not holding on to too much excess water because this can lead to rotting and rotting can bring down the plant so so quickly but then I've also got a Boston fern and this as I just spoke about is an epiphytic plant this is one that naturally grows typically attached to other plants, rocks, mossy banks, and this one needs a really, really chunky soil mix. And if I was to try growing this one in the same mix as this, the plant would not be happy and vice versa. It would lead to issues very, very quickly. So that's the sort of stuff that you can kind of pick up from research. Also, a lot of the time nowadays, you can buy pre-mixed soils for different types of plants. Like you can get a fern mix or an orchid mix and stuff like that, which can be very useful. But then also there's not just soil growing. There's lots of other ways that you can also grow. You can look at hydroponic growing, which basically means growing your plants completely in water. This is something that some plants tend to like more than others, and there's various benefits to doing it. But I would say for me, and if you watch my channel, you will know, I am a massive fan of semi-hydroponic growing. And this basically means, I mean, it's in the name semi-hydroponic. It means that you are partially growing in water and you are also growing in a non-organic substrate. So this one here is lava rock, pumice, zeolite. This is essentially a, um, a fine mix of what's commonly known as Lechuza Pon and I absolutely love this for a lot of my plants and it just allows you to create a little water reservoir at the bottom here and your plant will essentially feed from the moisture that the substrate retains and that means that you don't need to worry about drainage. It just makes life really, really easy. And in my time of growing, I've figured out that some plants absolutely, some aren't as keen, but some absolutely love it. Alocasias, for example, calatheas, in my experience, just love it. So yeah, it's all about trial and error and figuring out what works for you but not just going in and guessing. I think when, when you're talking about substrates, just having a little bit of knowledge to start you off is a really good idea. Another area where I've really gone wrong in the past is potting up propagations too soon. And believe me, I completely understand why you want to jump in and transfer your plant to soil and get a whole new plant going. 
And I often get asked how long you should leave it, like how big should the root system be? And there's really no rule on it. There's no set rule. Some people say when the roots are growing roots, but I've got an example here, and this is a Scindapsis argareus, and I believe a Monstera Peru that I've had propagating for a really long time. These ones have been living happily in water for, I want to say about eight months now. And as you can tell, they have got an insane root system and they're absolutely ready to be potted up, but I have just decided to leave them a little bit longer. And that is what I would do if I was going back now. I would just say as a general rule, if you think your propagations are ready, great. Chances are they are, but why not leave it just that little bit longer? Because especially when you're transferring from either water spec, moss, perlite, whatever you're propagating in, especially when you're transferring your plants into soil, that can be a really big shock to the plant. And often that in itself is another little period of acclimation that your plant has to go through. So the bigger, the better with the root system. There is in general, so long as the roots aren't starting to turn or go green or anything like that in general there is no rule for how long you can leave a plant propagating so if any doubt wait it out that is what I would say and another mistake that I'm guilty of making several times over the years is not providing the right conditions for my plant and I've spoken about acclimating once you've acclimated your plant to your home environment you also absolutely need to think about how you can how you can provide the right conditions for that plant because a lot of the time it's very easy to see something growing beautifully in a garden centre and think oh well, you know what that would look lovely in that corner of my home and actually not thinking about whether or not that corner of your home is going to be right for that plant. Some plants require really really high levels of light, light that can only be achieved by putting them in a south-facing window or using a really strong grow light. Other plants are much more capable of growing in lower lighting conditions. Some need to grow in very low light conditions. So it is all about research here. And obviously there's gonna be some specifics that come very much down to you and your home. And that's where trial and error comes in. But typically for me, if I pick up a plant that I'm not familiar with, I will be straight on YouTube, straight on Google. I will be looking for other people that own the plant and I will be listening to their experiences and obviously taking everything with a grain of salt, but just thinking, okay, right, how can I, how can I add a little bit of that to my own home? What can I be doing to help make this plant settled in my environment? Because plants aren't meant to live in a home environment. We call these house plants. These are all outdoor tropical plants we're talking about. If we expect them to actually thrive and not just survive in our care, we're gonna have to put in a little bit of work. We're gonna have to. It's like getting a pet fish and expecting it to be able to survive in a hamster cage. You need to, you need to make a few adjustments. It also comes down to what you're trying to achieve with your plants because some plants, for example, are going to be amazing at surviving in lower lighting conditions, but you're not actually going to be bringing out the best potential in that plant unless you up its light. And I think this one here is a really good example of this. This is the Monstera dubia. And I get people all the time saying, that's not a Monstera dubia. That doesn't look anything like the Monstera dubias that are sold in shops. And I'll, put, I'll see if I can find a picture and put it on the screen, but my Monstera dubia only a couple of years ago started as a teeny tiny thing on a plank and I have been able to grow it to this absolute monster. And this is purely through very, very, very bright light. And when I first got this plant, I'd been told by so many people that this is one that was more than capable of surviving in lower lighting conditions. And I just acclimated this plant very slowly to be able to actually tolerate direct sun. And that's when I really started to notice significant growth and these beautiful fenestrations starting to form. And so I think it just goes to show that even if your plant is capable of surviving in one condition, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's what it likes. So again, it goes back to research and trial and error. <laughs> Creating different zones in your home can be a really good way to help group plants together that share similar care needs or have similar requirements. For example, I've brought my Calathea over to show you and this is one that, that, oh my goodness, can be such a dramatic plant and absolutely loves humidity. This one laps up humidity, the higher the better, and does not cope well if the humidity drops that low. So I've got this one in this room here, which as you can see, I've got a lot of my very kind of finicky, tropical, foliagey plants in, and this one lives very close to my humidifier. Whereas, for example, if I was to put 
a string of pearls in the same spot. This one is a succulent, a hanging succulent, and this one is a desert plant, and it does not like high levels of humidity whatsoever. If I was to put this one right next to the humidifier, chances are I would have issues very quickly, and this one would start to rot. And I live in a one bedroom flat, so there's obviously not a huge amount that I can do, but I've obviously created some cabinet spaces so I can create little controlled environments like that. And I also keep some of my plants through in the bedroom so I can have, for example, this room at 70% humidity and that room at 50. I just kind of mix it up and do what I can to keep my plants happy in that way. And another mistake that I've made multiple times in the past is repotting a plant too soon after getting it. And like I've already spoken about with acclimation, your plant is going to be going through a really big period of adjustment when you first bring it into your home. Even if it hasn't traveled overseas or it's been shipped or anything like that, going from one environment to a brand new environment is always going to require quite a lot of change for the plant. And that is the time where commonly you're going to experience the most issues. So repotting a plant at this time as well, unless there is absolute reason to do so, I would say don't do it. Just don't do it. Your plant is going through enough. Don't make it any more tedious of an adjustment for your plant at that time. And there have been times before where I've got a plant, in fact quite recently I got a plant off a rescue shelf at a garden centre, I brought it home, I looked at it and I was like, oh, I suspect there's probably root rot. If I don't deal with it now, the plant is likely going to die. Obviously in situations like that you do need to get in there, have a look at the roots, make sure everything's okay and make sure that you are able to save the plant. But otherwise, unless you suspect something is actually wrong, I would say don't do it. I would wait at least a few weeks and give your plant a chance to settle in, to adjust, and then if it needs it, go ahead and repot. But for example, if you look at my cabinet over here, I've actually got a plant that I got about six weeks ago now. This is a little Drymonia cherry bagana. And as I say, I've had this plant for five, six weeks now, and I still have not taken it out of the substrate it came in. I haven't even taken it out of the packaging that it was sent to me in because I am letting this plant adjust and I am leaving it alone. And a lot of the time that is the best possible thing you can do. I know for a fact there's been times in the past where I've had plants that have ended up going downhill because I've just kind of faffed over them too much and faffing over plants when they're trying to get used to their new environment is never the way to go. So as tempting as it is to get in there right away and start doing things to your new plants, I would say leave them alone. Leave them alone. Leave them plants alone. But when you do come to repot plants, when they're actually ready for a repot, if you are transferring a plant from soil to soil, for example, unless there's something wrong with the roots, then I would say don't, don't mess with the roots too much. Don't kind of, like I used to really try and get in there and get every single little bit of soil off the roots. And to be honest, nowadays, unless I'm transferring a plant into semi-hydro, I really don't bother. I really don't bother. I will give the roots a little loosen, just kind of shake the root ball, allow the roots to spread a little bit, but I won't worry about getting all of the soil off. I will just upgrade the pot size and that seems to work much better. And also the other thing that I wish I'd known about sooner is root pruning. And I wouldn't just go ahead and do this for any old plant if it didn't have a really big, well-established root system. But for some plants, anthuriums, for example, that kind of develop a very big, beefy root system quite quickly, often a way of actually getting your plants to just put out more growth and actually then develop a healthier and more solid root system over time. So yeah, I would just take a very, very sharp, very clean, either pair of scissors or pruning shears or something like that and just take a little bit off like in my experience you don't want to lop the entire root system back but if a plant has got a substantial root system a lot of the time you're actually going to kick it into action more by giving the roots a little prune than not and yeah that is something that I definitely wouldn't have thought when I first started getting into plants and something again that I didn't properly know about for a really long time and therefore made many many mistakes with is moss poles and if you use moss poles correctly they are going to be such a helping hand in replicating your plant's natural growing conditions and bringing out the best in your plants and I'm back here by my Monstera dubia again because I know this is a plant that is commonly oh, <laughs> commonly seen grown on a plank however if you look at the back of this one's moss pole here, 
you can see all of these aerial roots that have grown into it and that is helping to support the plant and offer it lots of micronutrients which in turn help the plant to size up, stay strong, stay healthy, stay resilient and obviously as well keep the plant climbing upwards. And not all plants require moss poles, in fact there's a lot of plants that don't need moss poles, but climbing plants, plants that grow upwards, vining climbing plants, will typically benefit from a moss pole. And mistakes that I've made is firstly just thinking that moss poles are stakes and they're just there to hold a plant upright. Moss poles and stakes are very, very different. If you wanted to stake a plant, you could just use a bamboo cane. As I say, a moss pole is there to offer lots of micronutrients, so it's really important important to make sure you're keeping your moss pole hydrated because if you don't keep it hydrated then the aerial roots aren't going to be able to properly attach to that. The plant isn't going to be able to gather all of the lovely things that it needs and you may as well not be, you may as well not be using a moss pole at all and I made so many moss poles over the years that I would just stick in the pot, tie the plant to and think right I'm done, I've done a moss pole and that is not the correct way of doing it whatsoever. I do also fertilise my moss poles so the aerial roots are able to absorb lots of lovely nutrients that they wouldn't otherwise be able to from the moss so this is another, just another way that you can get some goodness into your plants and again as I say replicate how it would be more so in its natural conditions. I have, however, also got plants such as the Raphidophora tetrasperma, which you can see just here. And this one is one that can be grown on a moss pole. And I'm currently not growing mine on a moss pole. I know if I wanted to kind of get it sizing up and probably growing a little bit faster, I could. But moss poles also take up a huge amount of room. So currently I'm deciding what to do with it. I'm not entirely sure, but yeah, I would have thought maybe at some point, at some point, a moss pole is on the cards for that one. <laughs> and the area where I've gone wrong so many times in the past, and to be completely honest, I think it is one of the main areas where people do tend to go wrong with plants, is when it comes to watering. And I know that seems like such a basic thing, but underwatering and overwatering a plant are both really, really easy things to do. And I say this in lots of my videos, but if you're unsure, teeter on the verge of underwatering as opposed to overwatering, just because it is so much easier to bring a plant back from near death that's been underwatered as opposed to overwatered. And when I say overwatering, I don't mean giving the plant too much water in one session. It basically just means watering too frequently, giving your plant water at times where it's not ready for a drink yet. And the way that I check, and I've got one here that I'm pretty sure is going to be ready for a drink. Um, oh yeah, it's very, very ready. Uh, and this is my Ficus alii. I don't talk about this plant enough. I absolutely love it. Um, but I'm just sticking my finger down into the soil there so I can feel. And obviously all plants have different watering requirements. And again, a lot of this will come down to research, getting to know your plants. I know that with this one, it likes to pretty much completely dry out before I water it again. So I let this one go until it feels like bone dry to touch. That's what works for me in my home. As I say, some plants will like their soil to remain consistently moist. It's all about finding out what your plant likes. But when I know that my plant is ready for a drink, what I personally do, and you definitely don't have to do it my way, this is just what I found works, is I take a washing up bowl and I've just got an oven grill on top at the moment. And that's what I use to let my plants drain on. And I'll just put my plant, I'll just turn the camera so you can see what I'm doing. I will just put my plant on top of it and I will give it a thorough, thorough, thorough soak through until water pours out of the bottom of the pot. You definitely can't overwater in one session. So if your plant's ready for a drink, genuinely give it, give it as much as possible. A thorough drenching is what pretty much every single plant loves. And once you've done that, it's really important to make sure that your plant has time to properly drain. And that's why with almost all of my plants, I keep them in their nursery pots or I make sure that I use a pot that has really, really good drainage because one of the biggest causes of root rot in plants, which is the thing that brings down so many house plants, is them not being able to properly drain. And you will actually end up overwatering without meaning to because water will basically just collect around the roots. The plant won't need 
all of that water and it will go stagnant and mouldy and horrible. And we don't want that for ourselves or our plants. So yeah, make sure your plants have time to properly, properly drain. And if I was using a ceramic pot, I would go ahead and I'd put this one back in now, but I do keep this one in a little basket. So I'm gonna just leave it here to drain for a little bit longer so that I don't ruin the floors. And another thing that I really wish I had known sooner is the misconceptions around pests and houseplants. Because when I first started getting into houseplants, I just thought that if you got pests, it meant that you were not good at it. It meant that you weren't really caring for your plants, that things were going wrong and that you should feel bad about yourself. And that is just so not the case. And in the probably six years now that I've had a lot of plants, in fact, longer than that, oh my God, I think about seven years now that I have had like a significant amount of plants. I honestly don't know if there has been a time that I have ever not had at least a few pests in my collection because it's just unavoidable. Honestly, you can do everything right and they're still gonna get in. And I think so long as you're staying on top of your pest checking and your pest treatment when you do see them, that's absolutely fine. Like a few pests here and there, don't need to worry about. It's an infestation that you need to be concerned about and not letting it get to the infestation stage. Because if you've never dealt with pests then my god honestly I envy you you are so incredibly lucky but I don't think that makes you in fact it definitely doesn't make you better or worse with plants than someone who deals with pests regularly there are certain things that you can put in place so that you aren't having to deal with pests as regularly but it just happens from time to time. I get a lot of questions from you guys about how pests actually get into your home in the first place. I know some of you have said like, I'm super, super careful. I always quarantine new plants. I always give them a wipe over. How do I keep getting pests? And it can be a variety of reasons, but the main ones tend to be just leaving your windows and doors open. They can get in that way. That if you go outside, they can come back in attached to your clothes. If you've got pets, for example, like when Yoli's out, she runs through the woods, she probably picks stuff up she'll bring it back and if you don't do any of that it can also literally be like fresh fruit and vegetables anything like that like I found mealybugs on a banana that I've bought before which is so gross but it can be as simple as that they just get in it just happens and the final mistake that I must admit I am still 100% guilty of making myself is preempting, setting overly ambitious growing goals and comparing my plants too much. And I think it is so easy to do this nowadays. We live in such a social media, social media time. Everyone's posting pictures of their plants online. And it's so easy to look at other people's plants and go, oh my God, why isn't mine doing that? Like, why can't I achieve that level of growth? What am I doing wrong? And a lot of the time it is just not about that. And I speak from firsthand experience because at one point, if you were on my channel a year and a half ago, I was growing 99% of my collection in my mum's conservatory, this huge big glass room. And I was achieving some amazing growth. And I was like, my God, this is easy. Well, not this is easy, but you know what I mean. I, I was like, this is incredible, the growth that I'm able to achieve in a UK home environment. And then I moved here and I didn't have a glass ceiling anymore and things got a little bit more difficult. And although I am doing the same things, my plants aren't responding in the same way because the environment is just different. So yeah, try your best not to compare the growth of your plants to other people's and judge that on how well you are doing. Also, it comes down to the genes of the plant. Sometimes you might get a plant that might be capable of growing leaves to that size, but you've just got one that is kind of programs to grow to that size. That again is a normal thing and something that you kind of need to remind yourself from time to time. But yeah, if there's anything as well that you guys have learnt over your time of owning plants and you think it would be useful for other people to know, then please do let me know down in the comments below. I always love hearing your feedback and I love hearing what you would do differently. And yes, if you enjoyed this video, please make sure to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel, have a lovely day, and I will see you in the next video. Sexy plant lovers.